Take your Bible with me tonight. Let's turn over to Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 24. Once you find your place there, if you want to get ahead of me and put a marker at Luke 19. But I want to say kind of in advance so that you know what we're going to do. We're going to start in Matthew 24. We're going to go to Luke 19, but then we're going to come right back to Matthew 25. All right? So kind of keep your place in Matthew 24 when we turn over to Luke 19. We're in a series of messages talking about rewards. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? I don't know if you were, how many of you were here last week got to hear the message on rewards? It was to me, it's been, I feel like every week the message is just great. And I, I so enjoy my study on rewards. And it's amazing to me how many verses of Scripture there are about rewards. I mean, it's just all over the Bible. And I wish I had time to literally give you every single verse in the Bible that talks about rewards. It, it is literally from Genesis, everything in the middle, all the way through Revelation. Unbelievable how many things that the Bible talks about rewards. And uh, so I want to just kind of do a real quick, I'm not, I don't have time to go back and do last week's message, but if you missed last week's message, please get uh, the podcast. You can go online, it's free, it doesn't cost you anything. If you're still needing CDs, we do the CDs and we, we'll get you a CD and you can, I think you can, at the bookstore, is that right? You can inquire at the bookstore and those guys can help you with a CD. But I really want you to get this. I want you to understand that God has rewards. And I can't imagine a better series to follow uh, it's all about grace, because it really is salvation is all about grace, than to follow it with rewards. And let me tell you why. Because again, rewards will not save you. Okay? You get rewards by works. P please hear me. You get rewards by your behavior. But those things cannot save you. They cannot save you. Salvation is by grace and by grace alone. It is, it is, it is by truly believing in God. I'm going to show you a couple of verses here to start off just to kind of wet your whistle for where we were last week. But I want to just remind us, you cannot be saved by works. But I'm telling you, God has saved you unto good works. Please hear me. There's a difference in being saved uh, by works and being saved unto works. You are not saved by works. But you are saved unto good works. God has called us to minister. He's called us to do good things. So let me just show, real quickly show you some verses of Scripture. First two verses, Jesus said himself specifically. Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then, will then, when he comes, will then, and by the way, it's very important for tonight's message, we realize that Jesus is coming back. Will then repay Every man uh, according to his faith. Is that what it says? No. Okay, I want you to understand, we are saved by our faith, but we are repaid by our efforts, by our works. Okay, are, are you hearing me? Again, in other words, you can be saved by faith and not have any good works and not get any rewards when you get to heaven, but you'll get to be in heaven. And there was a verse of scripture we used about that last week that, that's going to be burned up, wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, uh, precious jewels, and it's going to be tested by fire. And he goes, and some, they're not going to have anything, but they will be saved. That's what that verse said. So it's a very important thing we understand that. Revelation 22, verse 12 says, and this is a verse we looked at last week, says, behold, I am coming quickly. I don't want us to forget, he is coming again. And that's very important for tonight's message. He says, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. And then I want to just kind of go to this uh, one more time. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Most of us know it says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And I know someone says, see, right there, Pastor, it's, it's not about your works. You're right. It is not about your works for salvation. But after you're saved, you're saved under good works. Because watch this. That's verse 9. Notice verse 10. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Okay. I want to just point out two words real quick. They're very tiny little words, but I think they'll help us understand this whole process. So verse 8 says this, for by, notice that little word, by grace. Notice we are saved, how? By grace. Okay, look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, uh, for we are the workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Notice there's a difference in the word, for good works. Okay, we are saved by grace, but we're created for good works. Are you following that? There's a difference in by and for. We are, we are not saved by works. We are saved by grace, but we are saved for good works. 
That's what the Bible is trying to say. We are saved so that we will do good things. God wants you to do good things. And you can do them. You can do them. Every one of us can, can do good works. And we can be rewarded in the end. So I wanted to show you some verses tonight. Here's the big question. Last week I told you, when we get to this week's message, I'm going to talk to you about uh, why do we need treasure? What, what, what are we going to use treasure for when we get there? Why is it that God says store up treasure in heaven and not on earth? What are we going to use this treasure for? So I'm going to answer that question tonight. Say, so let me, let me give us a question, and this will be kind of the title of the message tonight. And here it is. Does our stewardship on earth affect eternity? Let me just say it one more time. Does our stewardship on earth affect eternity? And the answer to that is, yes, it does. Okay, uh, again, l listen to me very clearly. It does not affect your salvation. Your works, you don't ever come to me and say, if I were to say to you, hey, uh, why should God ever let you in his kingdom? Please do ne never come to me and say, because I'm a good person. Because here's the reality. If you have that view, uh, you're not good enough and you're not going to be there. P please hear me, because it is not by your good works that you're going to get in. You get in by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way where any of us are going to get in. So please don't ever come to me and tell me, well, pastor, you know, I'm a good person. And I'm, I have a lot of people who say that. But listen, in this church, I want us to understand as believers, we don't get in on our works. Okay, it's very important. But let me, let me, I, want you, I want you to hear me. When we get in, there is a judgment coming. In fact, the Bible describes two judgments in the Bible. It describes the great white throne judgment, and it describes the judgment seat of, of Christ. Okay, I want you to think about this. Uh, every unbeliever will be at the great white throne judgment. Every unbeliever. Okay, I've got good news for you. If you're a believer, you don't have to go through the great white throne judgment. That, that is so good. Because listen, if you have to go through the great white throne judgment, judgment's already been passed down, and you're already condemned and found wanting. How many of you are glad we don't have to go through that judgment? I mean, it's good news. Okay, but, but we all, as believers, have to go through the judgment seat of Christ. Now, listen, here, here's what you need to understand about the judgment seat. The judgment seat takes place in heaven. If you're at the judgment seat, you're already in. Now, uh, that's, it's good news that you're in, but it may be bad news. He may be looking at you saying... Uh, what did you do for me? Uh, I, and here's what I hope that he'll say of all of us. Well done, by good and faithful servant. Enter into, the, into, enter into my joy. We're going to look at the verses tonight that actually uses that. But I want you to understand, it is not my works that got me before his judgment seat. It was my faith in God. But when I get there, he's going to judge every idle word that I've ever spoken. He's going to judge every idle attitude that I had here on earth. He's going to judge every prejudice that may be in my heart. Are y'all following this? And he's going to judge whether I loved people or didn't love people. If I served him while I was on earth or didn't serve him on earth. And, and by the way, it's not going to affect whether I get to stay or not. Okay? But it is going to affect my eternity. I'm telling you because our stewardship on earth affects how we're going to live out in heaven. And I hope that you're like me. I want to have a good living when I get there. I do. And it doesn't mean, by the way, the worst part of heaven is still great. Okay. But I'm telling you, there's better parts and there's better things that God has for you. And we got to be faithful now so that when we get there, we can be in on it. Okay. So let me show you some verses of scripture tonight. By the way, last week, a statement that I made, I want us to re be reminded of it, is your belief determines where you'll spend eternity. But it is your behavior that determines how you'll spend eternity. Did you catch that? It's a very important statement. Let's look at a verse of scripture. Matthew 24. And look down to verse uh, 45. Matthew 24, verse 45. Jesus is speaking here, and here's what he says. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at their proper time? Okay, I, I, I just want to draw your attention to just a couple of very important words. Notice the master did something. What did he do? He put them in charge. Do you notice those words? They're very, very important. In fact, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, when you look at those words, it, there's one 
place in the Bible, you can look at the, a certain Greek word, and you'll discover that it's just talking about serving, just normal serving. But this is actually, when it talks about put in charge, it refers to the affairs of state. I want you to think about that. So, uh, if, if I were to say, if, if our president tonight were to call you and say, I want to put you in charge of some affairs of the state, would you think that might be a pretty important job? Okay, listen to me. That's what this is saying. It's saying the master put them in charge of the affairs of state. If you don't know this, believers, uh, we are ambassadors in this world. And you have been put in charge of the affairs of state, every one of us. And we're going to be judged based on how we take care of the affairs of state here on earth. Let me, let me put it a different way. Uh, uh, I, want to th I, want to think, I want you to think about a kingdom, because most of the time when we start thinking about a kingdom, we think about heaven, think about getting to go to heaven. Okay. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of an embassy? Uh, how many of you know we have U.S. embassies all over the world? And if you're in a foreign country and you go into a U.S. embassy from in a foreign country, uh, do you know what soil you stand on in that foreign country? U.S. soil. Okay, listen to me. We are ambassadors of an embassy. We are over the affairs of state, and we bring a little bit of heaven on earth. Did y'all follow that? Okay, here's what he's saying. The master put him in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing. In other words, doing his job, doing what's right. When he comes, notice he is coming. Truly, I say to you that he, will, uh, that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Okay, I want you to just notice some interesting things here. He says, on earth, the first verse, verse 45, is telling us that you, you were put in charge on earth. Uh, verse 46 says he's coming again. And verse 47 says, and if he finds you faithful, what do you get in heaven? Because again, if he comes back, aren't we going to heaven? Okay, guess what happens? We get put in charge. Uh, someone says, uh, what are we going to do with the treasure when we get to heaven? I want to I say it real clear for you, and then I'm going to explain it to you at the end of the message. And let me tell you what it is. We're going to rule. We're going to rule. We are going to rule when we get to heaven. And, and, I, and I know some of you are sitting there thinking, so stay with me in this message. It's very important. But I know someone in this room is probably thinking, and I, I don't want to rule. I just want to rest. <laughs> okay. So stay with me, and I'm going to talk about why it's great that we get to rule when we get to heaven, okay? And it's very important you understand that, and because I know someone's going to think, I, I'm too tired, but it's okay. It's going to be great, and, and God's way we rule is way better than what you'd ever think of here on earth, okay? So we'll talk about that when we get to the end. Okay, so hold your place there in, in Matthew 24. We're coming back to Matthew 25 in a moment, but let's skip over to Luke 19, okay? Luke 19, and look down to verse 11. You ready? Luke 19, and I'm giving you a moment because I really want you to look at this. And I know we put the words on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, we want you to be able to see that. But I want you to bring your Bibles to church with you because it's important to see some amazing things that are in it. Okay, so Luke 19, look at verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because... Now I want you to remember, uh, he's going to tell some parables, but it's important to understand why he's telling the parable. Because... He was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Okay, let me tell you where we are in the story. We're, we're nearing the last week of Jesus' life on earth. And they were nearing Jerusalem. And his disciples were thinking, this might be the time where God, where Jesus is going to set up his earthly kingdom, uh, his, his kingdom on earth. Uh, and so they were getting kind of excited about it because they're thinking to themselves, we're going to rule. We're going to reign. And, and he is going to go in there and he is going to whip uh, people and he's going to destroy people. And if they're his enemy and they've got this picture about how God is going to bring his kingdom on earth, and it's really an all completely wrong uh, picture. In fact, we find in the next few pages where Jesus actually goes into the temple and he makes a whip and he drives them out. And they're thinking to themselves, even in that moment in Jerusalem, this is it. 
Told you, here it comes, okay? So he's trying to tell us they were near Jerusalem, and here's what the people were thinking. They supposed the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Here it is. It's, it's right now. Here we are. It's coming right now. So that's what's going on. They think that this is the second coming of Jesus right now. Never mind, uh, you know, that he would never left. But anyway, they're thinking this is it, all right? So verse 12. So I want you to notice this is why he's telling the parable. So he said, he tells them a parable. A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Uh, without me explaining it, did you catch what he's talking about? Okay, let me, let me read it one more time because you've got to catch this because they're thinking about the return of Christ. They're thinking about the kingdom being set up. So here's what he says. A nobleman, I wonder who that might be, went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself uh, and then return. Who do you think the nobleman is? Anyone? Come on. It's not a squirrel. You got... Okay. It's Jesus. Verse 13. That was a joke I told several months ago. So, Verse 13. And he called ten of his slaves and he gave them ten minas. And said to them, do business with this until I come back. Okay, let me tell you what a mina is. A mina is a hundred days wages. That's what one mina is. It's a hundred days wages, okay? So uh, how many days wages did he give them? A thousand, all right? Y'all know how to, so ten times, okay, making sure. All right, so, and by the way, I think that might be significant. I want you to think about it, a thousand. I want you to think about it like this, okay? A day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. I want you to think about that. So he gave him a thousand days' wages. He says to him, uh, he says, uh, do business with us till I come back, verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Okay, let me tell you who the citizens are. Okay, so I told you the nobleman. The nobleman is Jesus. And, and when he gives to his servants, he's talking about, uh, believers. Are y'all following that? And then when he says his citizens, let me tell you, who do you think owns this world? We got that? Okay. When he says his citizens, he's talking about everyone who's in the world. Let me, let me put it a different way. He's talking about unbelievers. Okay. And here's what it says. Let me, let me just read it this way. He says, uh, uh, his unbelievers hated him. And they sent a delegation to him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. Okay, who's the man? Believers. Does it sound like today? <laughs> because here's what he's saying. I don't want believers to rule over us. That's what, that's what he's saying. Are y'all following this story? Okay, it's important we catch all the figures. Verse 15. When he returned... After receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so they might know what business they had done. Okay, why don't you get this? He returns. You want to see the picture? He returns, and he says, what have you been doing? Okay, I'm telling you, if you're not, if this ought to be really simple for us as believers. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to ask the question, what have you been doing? What have you been doing? Uh, verse 16. Verse 16. Uh, the first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made me ten minas more. In other words, he had a thousand days worth of wages and he made a thousand, another thousand days worth of wages. He said, I've done more. I've, I've doubled what you gave me. And notice verse 17. He said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in very little. You are to be in authority over ten cities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you follow what he said? <laughs> He says, because if you're, if you're following the story, uh, and by the way, this is Jesus talking. I think he knows a little bit about what's going to happen in heaven. And he said, I gave you some uh, financial means on earth. And because you were faithful with it and you doubled it, when you get to heaven, you're going to rule over 10 cities. Did you all follow that? I'm, I'm going to have you rule over 10 cities. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So he says, uh, you're going to rule over 10 cities. Uh, verse 18, the second came saying, 
your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. Okay. I, I, I hope that maybe you're paying attention. Sometimes we miss things that are missing in scripture. Do you remember what he told the man who had 10 minas, who made 10 more minas? What did he tell him? Well, what, what was it? Come on. Well done, thy good slave. Okay, follow this. Very important you catch this. Isn't it interesting? Uh, this guy had 10 minas, but he only made five minas back. He, 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 here, let me, could, is it possible that he could have had 10 also? But he didn't work quite as hard. And is it possible that the reason he still said you're going to rule, but he didn't say well done. Uh, you, you did pretty good. You could have done better. So I'm still going to put you in charge of five cities. I'm going to let you rule five cities. But he didn't say well done. I don't know about you. I'm telling you one of the, one of the lines I hope that I hear my master say one day to me is well done. I, I want to hear him say that. So he says, uh, I'm going to give you five cities. Verse 20, another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept, put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you're an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, and you reap what you did not sow. He said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Uh, hey, uh, let me tell you what's worse than not getting well done? <laughs> you worthless slave. Did you know that I'm an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank and having come, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Okay. Uh, how many minas did this guy have? Ten, right? And he gave it to the one who had how many? Ten minas. Okay, the one that he said, well done to. Okay, now get this. He said, I'm going to give you ten cities. And when this guy shows up and he wasn't faithful with the ten that God gave him while he was on earth. Are you following this? He gave him ten more cities. Okay, if you're doing math, how many cities is he now in charge of? Twenty cities. Because he said he was faithful. He was faithful with it. Uh, and he said, Master, uh, he, uh, watch this. They said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them. Okay, watch this. Because he's talking about the citizens. They did not want the rule of the Lord in their life. He says, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Okay, I want you to notice there's two judgments. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't say the guy who had the ten uh, perished with them. It doesn't say that. He just lost everything. He got to be in heaven, thank the Lord, but he didn't have anything to show for it when he got there. Are you following that? Okay, and he says, uh, but the world, they're going to be slayed in my presence. That's what's going to happen. Uh, let, me, let me show you one more passage of Scripture. Turn back to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Hopefully, uh, on your own, you're kind of picking up what Jesus is saying through this story. And you're seeing that it's very, pretty important, our behavior. Can we agree with that? It's pretty important. And the question we're asking is, does our stewardship on earth affect our eternity? Okay, Matthew 25. Look down to verse 14. And uh, it's going to sound like the same story but it's not, and you'll figure out why. Okay, so watch this. Matthew 25, verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one, he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Okay, uh, do you notice the similarities? But do you notice the difference? Okay, uh, here, here's what he says. Uh, in the first story, it says he gave 10 minus to every one of them. So there were three of them, and each of them got 10 minus. In this story, there were three. One got five, one got two, one got one. And then here, and it adds these really important words, according to his own abilities. Okay, let, let me just say to you, uh, 
it's very important you understand. Uh, God uh, will only give you what he thinks that you can handle. And whatever God has given you, he believes that you can. Okay, let me say it a different way. Uh, God has faith in you to do the job that he's given you. You may not even have faith in yourself, but God believes in you. I'm saying to you, if you're a believer, we've all been handed something. We all have ability. And maybe there's someone who has more ability than what you do, but God still sees ability in you, and he wants you to use the ability that he's given you. It doesn't matter if your only ability is one. If it only adds up to one, that's enough. Uh, you know, uh, let me, let, me, let me change a little statement. We, one of our uh, favorite churches uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in this area is, is Gateway. We love Gateway. We love Pastor Robert Moore. So it's such a godly man. We, I pray for him regularly. Okay, listen to me very clearly. Uh, God's not expecting me to do what Gateway has done. God's expecting me to be faithful with what he's given me here. Does that make sense? So you, you, don't sit around trying to compare. Your, well, I don't have as much as them. I don't have what they've got. If I had what they've got, let me be honest with you. No, you wouldn't. I mean, don't sit there and think that you, would, you could do more if you had what they had. No. God's not asking you to do what they've done. He's asking you to do what he's given you to do. So often, the first thing we do is judge. Can't you imagine the guy who has one talent going, he gave him five. Well, you wouldn't even handle the one. Are you, are you following that? So listen, I'm telling, I'm telling you as a believer tonight, you have ability. And God has entrusted something in your life. And what you're doing right now, the stewardship with what God has given you right now is going to affect your eternity. What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, let me read on. Uh, verse 16. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and he gained five more talents. Okay, what did he do? What, what, if you gain five more, what is that? Double, right? Uh, some of you might need help with this, especially if you're paying the lottery tonight. Anyway, so <laughs> double, right? Okay, he got double. I'm not telling you to go play the lottery. All right. <laughs> All right, verse 17. In the same manner, the one who had received two talents gained what? What did he do? Doubled it. Okay, in the story of the minus, the servant... Uh, where God said, well done, thy good and faithful servant. What did he do with what he had? Doubled. doubled it. Okay, this is why it's so important you understand God is asking you to double what he gave you. I mean, it really is the answer. If you want to know, double what he's given you. So he goes on to say, but he who received the one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, hid it, his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, watch these words, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay, wonder what he's going to tell the second guy. Verse 22, also the one who received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. Watch what the master says. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful uh, in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay, here's, here is the greatest news that you'll ever hear. God's not expecting you to do what your neighbor is going to do right next to you. God is not asking you to compare yourself to other people and what they have done. That's great news. I, I don't know about you, that is great news. Listen to me, I'm, let me say it a different way. God is not asking Mark Allen to be Billy Graham. But he is asking me to be faithful where he's placed me and double it. Is, is that good? Okay, listen to me. He doesn't do it just for pastors. He does it for all believers. And where you are, you need to be thinking, I need to double it. I need to double what God has given me. I, I need to return what God has given to me. 
Uh, watch this. He says, uh, verse 24, and the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talents in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, watch this, verse 28, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. Because why? Because he who has a little and is faithful with a little will be given what? More, right? Okay, now this is a little different. This story is a little different. Watch verse 29. For to everyone who has, more shall be given and will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Watch this. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, I want to say something very clearly. Guys, I don't want you to get confused here. Uh, he is not saying you, he, this man lost his salvation. That's not what he's saying. Let me tell you what the difference is. The first three... Uh, one man was unfaithful, but he got to remain in heaven in the first story. In this story, the man who had one was unfaithful, and he didn't get to remain. But let me tell you why he didn't get to remain. He wasn't a believer. Let me say to you, God knows. I, I cannot say that clear enough. You can fool people who are around you. You can even attend church every single week and not be God's. And here's what I want to say to you tonight. I know the message is about rewards, but the first thing we need, to, we need to settle is how we have faith in Jesus. And if we're really trusting the Lord, think about it. If we're really trusting the Lord, won't we be faithful? I want you to think about this. Because there's many people who say, well, you know, uh, I prayed a prayer. But just praying a prayer, does that mean you truly trust God? There's a verse of scripture that's been kind of a, it's not my life verse, but it's a kind of a verse I've been living by for a lot of years. Most of you probably know it, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And here's what it says. He'll direct your path. He'll direct your path. But listen, what about the person who won't trust the Lord but says, he's my Lord? Have you thought about that? People who say, oh, he's my master, but you won't do what the master says. Do you really belong to him? Are you following that? Okay, again, here's what I think the difference is. I think you can give word service and you've never given your heart. And I'm saying to you tonight, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? I want you to give your heart to Jesus. It's the most important thing of all. Do you know the Lord? And does he know you? Have you put your faith in him? And if you have, we, would, we ought to want to serve him. We ought to want to honor him. We ought to want to bless him. So the question is, does our stewardship on earth affect our eternity? And the answer is pretty clear. Yes. Uh, so let me give you three misconceptions about heaven. Okay, three misconceptions about heaven. Uh, here's, here's the first misconception. Heaven is the same for everyone. Obvious from this, it's not. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me speak to something real quick, because I know uh, I said I would speak to this, uh, talking about ruling in heaven, because I know someone's going to say, Pastor, I don't know if I really want to rule. I just kind of want to rest. Okay, let me help you with ruling in heaven. Okay, we, we don't want to rule in heaven for this reason, because some of us have ruled on earth, and we know how hard it is right? It is hard to rule. Okay, I want you to think about this. In heaven, there will be no sin. There will be no envy, no jealousy, no anger. Everyone's perfect. Yeah, I want to rule that. <laughs> I, I, I have said, and pl please don't take me wrong, but I'm going to say it <laughs> Because it's, it's important you hear it, okay? Pastoring would be really easy if it wasn't for people. <laughs> Some of y'all have killed me. Anyway, <laughs> getting gray right here. You just don't know it. I cover it up every week. Okay, but here's what's great. And, I, and, I, and please hear my heart because I do love you. I love every one of you. But listen to me. When we get to heaven, 
don't think that ruling is going to be hard. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a, and by the way, the word rule in the Bible is synonymous with another word, serve. It is going to be a joy to serve you when we get to heaven because you'll finally be perfect. So anyway, <laughs> do you understand? So don't think, man, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to rule it. You do. I'm telling you, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be amazing to rule with God's people, to serve with God's people in a perfect place, isn't it? So let me just say, uh, the heaven's same for everyone. No, it's not. not. Not everyone's going to get to rule over the same amount, and some won't rule over any. Right? And I'm glad we're all going to be there, but I hope that you'll come and rule with me. Amen? I want you to rule too. I want us all to rule when we get there. Here's, here's misconception number two. Uh, God will reward everyone the same no matter how hard we work or if we're backslidden most of our lives. Okay, I, and I, I know people who are like this. I don't, you know, I'm saved now, so I can just go out and live any way that I want. I can go out and sin. Okay, that's a misconception. That is not what the Bible is trying to teach. You shouldn't sit there and take advantage of the grace that God has given you. Boy, someone ought to say amen on that because you're all worrying me just a little bit. All right? <laughs> Here's the third misconception. God gives us all gifts and talents, but it doesn't matter if we don't make the most of every opportunity. It's just not true. I'm telling you that God wants you to make the most of every opportunity. And if you have a gift and a talent, you need to use it. I mean, is that, any, is that clear? By the way, we don't all have the same gifts and talents. Uh, we don't all sing like angels. I, I'm just, and I know your mama told you you could sing, okay? But your mama would have told you that anyway. She loved you that much, all right? But please hear me. We don't all have the same gifts and talents. We don't. But we all have talents. We all do. And there's a place where God has for you to serve and to honor him and to bless him. So, misconception number three. Let me give you some verses of scripture and we'll kind of close, all right? Matthew 19, 29 says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Is that a reward? Uh, let, me, let me say it a different way. Everyone who's ever lost a house, lost a father, lost a mother, lost a brother, lost a sister, lost a child. But you were serving the Lord. You were honoring the Lord. And you never gave up. Because I know some of you have lost things. But you never gave up. God says there's a reward. You're going to get a hundredfold reward. Is that great news? Is that great news? Luke 12, 33 says, Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Here's what God's saying. Uh, you know, you might lose some things in this world, but if you will invest in the kingdom, you'll never lose it. That's great news, isn't it? And let me give you one uh, last section of scripture. Luke 16, 10 says, and this is very important to catch this, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And the one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? Okay, I know we've been talking about in this series the importance of what you do here on earth. But isn't it interesting that Jesus talks about your money? Do you know the one area where people seem to really fail? Money. You know where most people struggle? Money. Do you know what the number one reason for arguments inside a marriage is? Money. Okay, listen to me very carefully. Here's what he says. If you're unfaithful with unrighteous wealth, let me say something about your money. It's not righteous, right? Uh, how many of you were here when we did the series with Pastor Robert, The Blessed Life? How many of you were here for that? Okay, you remember what he talked about? Uh, he talked about that uh, 10% of it belongs to God. And when you give the 10th, the rest is redeemed. Some of you are living on unrighteous wealth because you haven't redeemed it. Are you following that? 
Uh, watch, it, watch this very next part. Watch this. Uh, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Okay, I want you to catch this. The reality is none of our money belongs to us. And if you're unfaithful with something that doesn't even belong to you, why would he give you more when you get to the kingdom? Are, are you following that? Let, let me say a, a different way. <clears throat> this series really is not about a tithe, but I'm saying to you, I think it's a scriptural principle that when we tithe, there's a reward. Let me tell you the two rewards of the tithe. The first reward is this. When you tithe the tenth, the rest is redeemed here on earth. That's great news. But let me tell you the second part of the blessing. When we tithe here on earth, we are laying up treasure in heaven. There is a blessing for those who've done it God's way. I don't know how to say it any clearer to you. Again, I hope you'll understand. We as a church, we don't beg for money. If, if you'll know, we don't pass plates. We do teach on it. And the reason we teach on it is because it's truth. It's biblical truth. I want you to hear it. And if you're visiting tonight, we're not here trying to get your money. Here's what we're trying to get. We're trying to get you to come to the place where you realize God has rewards for you. And listen, I'm living under God's rewards. I am personal testimony of the rewards of God and the blessings of God. Listen to me. Every one of us can have the same blessings. But we've got to stop doing it our way, and we need to start doing it his way. Let me talk about, real quick, I'm going to close this with this. There's five parts to this story. Part one is where God commissions believers. Uh, part two is where uh, God goes away. He leaves. Part three is where God gives an opportunity. Part four is where he returns. And part five is where he rewards. Okay? Uh, and you see that in both of these stories. Okay, let me just ask you the question. Uh, where are you? in those parts. Well, obviously, he hasn't returned, so none of us have gotten to part four or part five, right? Uh, if you're an unbeliever, you've never come to the part of being commissioned. P please hear me. You can't even get to the opportunity to serve the Lord and get rewards until you know Jesus. You hear that? So if you're an unbeliever, you've never met Jesus as your Savior, the first thing you need to do is come to Jesus and let him commission you for a task. Bless you with the ability to serve him. Are you following that? That's first. But let me say this. He's left. He's not here. Let me tell you where we all are if we're believers. We're in the opportunity. Let me say this a little different. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. We're living in opportunity. Don't think, well, you know, Pastor, I'm older now. It, it's funny to me. I've heard when I was younger, uh, I would hear people say to me, uh, you know, Pastor, I really don't have time to serve the Lord right now, but when I get older and when I retire, <laughs> I'll serve the Lord. Now that I'm getting older, uh, I hear more the retired side saying, uh, I'm kind of tired, and I don't feel like it. Uh, it's all an excuse to not take care of the opportunity that God has given us all. Let me, I'm going I'm, I'm to close with this one question. Isn't it interesting in this story he talks about slaves? So here's my question. Are you a servant? Are you a servant? It's a good question, isn't it? I want to say to you, I love you so much, but I want to challenge you. We all need to serve one another in love as long as it's called today. Is that good?